Good morning. This is Ivo Dalder, President of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and welcome to World Review, a weekly program where we look at the world news uh, through a different lens. Uh, and today, very pleased to have joining us uh, Susan Glasser, staff writer of The New Yorker. Susan, great to have you. Thanks for having me back. And Peter Spiegel, the U.S. Managing Editor of the Financial Times. Peter, great to have you. Always good to be with this crowd. And Stephen Erlanger, the chief diplomatic correspondent in Europe, who joins us from uh, for the New York Times, who joins us from Brussels. Steve, great to have you. Nice to be here, virtually. Uh, well, uh, we, we live in a world these days, don't we? Um, today, of course, is also Juneteenth. It's, uh, it's the day we remember the abolition of slavery in Texas 155 years ago, uh, a day that uh, I think many of us are... Uh, uh, seeing through the lens of what has happened in our own country and indeed uh, around the world, a growing awareness among uh, people of all ages, uh, of all races, uh, of the systematic uh, and structural racism that continues to exist in our societies. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Dutchman who came here uh, as an American, as an immigrant by choice, and I'm well aware uh, that uh, black Americans came here uh, to this country in chains. Um, we all are learning about who we are uh, in, these, in these days, and one of the things I learned when I visited the National Museum of African American History is that the Dutch were the leading slave traders uh, uh, to bring uh, slaves to the United States, uh, something that, frankly, uh, in my own history and my own upbringing, uh, I didn't know. I think we're all learning, uh, uh, and we're, we use uh, a, a day like this but to sustain uh, the importance of understanding what's happening in our society and importantly to change it. Um, Peter, uh, how do you, how do you see this day? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, you know, as a, as a forum here for, for global affairs and, and having been a foreign correspondent for much of the last decade, the thing that, that comes to me is the extent to which this has been a stain on America's image abroad for, for, for centuries, frankly. And you know, so much of what the U S is able to do in global affairs is about moral suasion, this whole concept Joe and I talked about, about soft power. You know, it, the, the ability of the U.S. to bring that moral suasion, to serve as a model, has been so undermined and, 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 and stained, as I said, because of our history, and, and not even just our history, our even our current uh, uh, situation on race in the U.S. Um, and I do not think that will be resolved until we deal with these issues. I mean, we've seen you know, Russian state TV, uh, the Chinese uh, foreign ministry use these incidents to show uh, how the U.S. should not be held up as a model. And so I think it's imperative for us as Americans to deal with these things at home if we are to be uh, what we want to be, which is a paragon for, for and a model for, for other nations. And so um, as someone who spent a lot of time overseas, that was always struck me about this issue. It's not something we just talk about here and, and have tr struggled to deal with domestically. It affects very harshly our, our image abroad. Uh, Susan, uh, how, uh, how, how would you think about the day and what it means for, for, for you and for the society in which we're living today? Well, you know, it's very interesting, Ivo. Thank you so much uh, for bringing this up because I, you know, sitting here on, I think the first ever uh, official holiday uh, for the New Yorker, for, for Condé Nast, for many media companies have taken this extraordinary step of uh, creating a new holiday for their employees. It's something, uh, you know, kind of like watching the toppling very belatedly of these Confederate statues. It, it shows you on the one hand that a society when moved to action can move very, very quickly. Uh, and yet of course, America has moved so, so slowly when it comes to issues of racial injustice and uh, looking at its own past through a critical lens, right? So on the one hand, in two weeks time, we have created new holidays, we have toppled statues, we have introduced legislation in both the sclerotic U.S. House and U.S. Senate. Uh, on the other hand, how the heck is it that we still have statues of Confederate leaders uh, all over this country. How is it possible 155 years after the end of the Civil War that we have allowed a cult of defeated traitorous slaveholders to take hold and to remain 
a terrible, terrible part of our own legacy, right? So, you know, we're grappling once again uh, with, uh, you know, things that should have been dealt with so long ago, uh, but have been made resonant in our present policies. It's, it's much easier to talk about history than it is to talk about any country uh, through the painful lens of the present. Uh, and so I find that to be interesting that we've immediately turned to statue toppling. Peter mentioned the uh, role of uh, America's vast gap between its image of itself and you know the reality of how it has treated uh, its African American citizens as a, as a pain point in international relations forever. It's been four years in the former Soviet Union for the Washington Post, and one of the first things, in fact, actually the first time I visited the uh, park where they hold the fallen statues of Lenin's and other Soviet icons in Moscow. Uh, I, I visited there on the very day that Vladimir Putin in March of 2000 was elected president of the Russian Federation. And, you know, it's, a, it's an incredible site. This is the, the statue of the secret police leader that was toppled in the middle of the uh, essentially revolution in uh, 1991 in Russia. And you know what? What I met there were uh, security state uh, guy, a guy who worked at the FSB, and he was there not to show his girlfriend uh, the horrors of the Soviet past. He was there to pay homage to Vladimir Putin, a former KGB official who was being elected on that very day uh, to be the leader of Russia. We all, uh, uh, Steve, have uh, histories, and all countries have, have histories, not only our own. Uh, you live in a particular country that is, uh, that is starting to confront its own history. Uh, in, in, in Belgium. Evo, it's, it, it is a very strange impact that the American civil rights movement, because this is part of a long civil rights movement, has had on uh, people of color in the rest of the world, particularly Europe. Um, it's had a negative impact, to, to be sure, but it's also had a very positive impact in the sense that it has inspired people to demonstrate themselves all over um, all, all over the continent. And it's been particularly interesting here in Belgium because King Leopold II, who wasn't actually all that long ago, owned the Congo himself. And um, under his ownership, horrible things happened. People had their arms cut off. Belgium got rich. Finally, he handed it over to to the actual Belgian state, um, but he, he was the king of the country. There are statues of him up everywhere. Some have been pulled down. It's a little more awkward when it's the king um, and he set up a museum um, in Belgium, um, at an African museum, which was really to honor his work in quote, civilizing unquote, black Africa. And Belgium has struggled with this. They uh, shut it down for quite a long time. They reopened it only last December to try to deal more honestly with the reality of the past. But um, the past always looks different from, from where you are in, in the present. There's still a lot of reckoning that will have to happen. And what's interesting to me, I have to say, and I'll just be very brief about this, about the debate, in Europe is that it, it kind of covers over another very serious debate, which also involves minorities, which is Islam and the way Europe is struggling, European democracies to deal with um, Muslims who have come to their countries, who live in their countries and who still do not feel much of a part. So there's this issue too. Um, but there's no question that what's happening in America has inspired many people in Europe to demand a fuller accounting of Europe's history and a fuller accounting of police behavior and a fuller understanding of their own rights. I think uh, in all of our countries, including, of course, here, um, the struggle to create an ever more perfect union is not something that is ever finished. It's one that we need to engage in and are engaged in uh, every single day. And I think it's a, it, it is testament to the power of still of the American ideal that other parts of the world are looking to us to see how uh, we might be able to, uh, to address their own issues themselves. It's a, 
it's an important moment uh, in time that I think is affecting uh, rightly uh, all of us, but also committing us to do to do better uh, in our workplaces, in our in our societies, and and uh, in our international en engagements. Um, so hopefully every day will be a better day uh, when we get on on this. So thank thanks for those reflections. I think it's 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 useful to start, particularly on this day, and particularly as as as, as Susan said, I think all four of our organizations. Uh, have now made this a, an annual paid holiday, uh, and that uh, uh, that is the least that we can do to start the process uh, of change. Um, let's uh, let's move on to the week's the week's other news. Not that uh, this is not important news; it's extraordinarily important. Uh, but a lot has happened too, uh, including the yet to be published book uh, by John Bolton. Uh, uh, in the room where it happens, I think Lynn Emanuel has said that he really doesn't like that uh, the use of his famous song for, for his title. Uh, but Susan, you got an early copy. Uh, you wrote a terrific piece uh, in, uh, in the New Yorker already on, uh, on the book uh, uh, without telling us what, ever, what, what else is in the 494 pages of text. Uh, what, what was your big takeaway? Look, uh, you know, the question is, are we going to be debating John Bolton uh, and uh, whether he was right to write this book and why didn't he testify in the impeachment hearings or uh, are we, as he hopes, going to be talking about Donald Trump and the uh, sort of extraordinary revelations about the President of the United States. This is unlike any tell-all book I've ever seen. You know, I've been around Washington for, for more decades than I would like to remember. Uh, Peter and I worked together as young reporters uh, when we were just out of college and that was a long time ago. Uh, I think I've read just about every major tell-all book from from every administration, you know, probably going back to the Reagan era before I was, uh, you know, working just because I've done a book that's coming out this fall on Jim Baker, and I've never seen anything like this. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's a reminder of how extraordinary this moment is that we don't even have the language really to convey just how much of a departure Donald Trump is from any norm of a president. And so what I would say is that if you've been paying attention, as you surely have, if you're listening to this conversation, uh, you will not be surprised uh, that Donald Trump is an ignorant, foul-mouthed, uh, capricious, uh, would-be autocrat who admires strongmen, disdains allies, treats adversaries uh, with puzzling uh, 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 respect and has no real policy principles, and uh, his major and seemingly only goal while in office is to secure his own reelection, right? That is a portrait that is already familiar. And yet, this book offers detailed chapter and verse, and, you know, facts matter. Uh, and it does seem to me that understanding the very nature of uh, Trump's transgressions, if you will, is something that is probably a worthwhile exercise. Uh, and remember, John Bolton uh, is the first person who literally had access to Donald Trump every single day of the presidency for 17 months that he was his national security advisor. So we've had, uh, you know, kind of tell all accounts, but, you know, what did Omarosa? Uh, what did Cliff Sims, a guy you never heard of, you know, what did they really have to say? They did not meet with the president every single day in the Oval Office. They did not, uh, you know, sort of deal with every single issue of international importance that crossed Trump's desk. So, you know, with that said, I think the major new information contained in here uh, is the extent to which essentially Donald Trump does not support almost any of the policies that pass as Trump administration policies when it comes to international affairs. So that's very significant uh, for anyone who cares about the US and the world. And I would say that applies to China. It definitely applies to Russia. It un undoubtedly applies to our relationship with our European allies of both NATO and the European Union, whom he persists in private in referring to as adversaries, uh, essentially, rather than as partners. It does not apply, by the way, to uh, his dealings with the Pentagon. We've seen some of those rifts come out publicly recently, but it's very clear that even on substantive policy issues, although the president brags incessantly about increasing the budget 
for the U.S. military. He's, he's not at all on the same page with their views of uh, U.S. national security and what's required. Uh, and so, you know, I could go on. For me personally, one of the most hair-raising things, if you read one chapter, not just for the news value, but just to understand this, read John Bolton's account of the Singapore nuclear summit with Kim Jong-un. And, you know, I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to add 10 years to your life uh, if, you, if you care about these things. I'm not sure I can afford 10 years to my life. So uh, <laughs> I have to skip that uh, at, the, at the moment. But uh, let me take the point, Susan and, 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 and Peter, uh, weigh in here. Um, uh, that you, the, the reality of an administration and a president who are at loggerheads with each other on every single policy issue. And the national security advisor who's supposed to actually be the one that makes sure that the president and the administration are in, in, in lockstep uh, is very much part of having his own agenda uh, that is very different from the agenda that the president of the United States has. And I mean, that's part two of this really remarkable story. And remember, this has been the case for almost every national security advisor, maybe perhaps for the, the short-lived first one. H.R. Uh, McMaster certainly had the same problem where he wasn't John Bolton asking that he was trying to impose his own agenda on the White House, but he was trying to impose order, which clearly Trump did not want. You found that again from the Pentagon. There, there were there, the, the fact that there are foreign policy actors within the administration who feel it is part of their duty to counteract the president is problematic. But I wanted to get back to something that Susan said, which is something as journalists we feel very strongly about, which is facts matter. And and I, Susan is, of course, right. What I worry slightly about is in the current environment, facts don't matter. And, and um, you know, we have had, Susan, as you said, other books that have come out from, from minor figures. We've had James Comey book come out, okay, not a, not a person who's been in the office in the way that Bolton did, but pretty damning stuff in there. And then we've had sort of the journalistic versions, you know, with very stable genius by, by two Washington Post reporters that was, that was quite telling. Um, Greg Miller at the Washington Post also writing in The Apprentice. Lots of insider accounts that have all proven to be true and yet <laughs> has had no effect on his standing uh, in the polls. Um, and I guess the question I have is, okay, in the, the current environment where he has, you know, mishandled the pandemic, he has mishandled Black Lives Matter, is this a third thing that finally, you know, the, brings the, the, the straw that breaks the camel's back? Or is this a, a fodder for us um, who worry about these things, but actually in the broader scheme of things, facts don't matter, and, it, and, and it's going to have no impact in November, and, and that's what I worry about: is that that even someone as inside the, the the room as as Bolton was is going to have so little effect on the general view perception of Trump as president um, that it will have no lasting impact. Steve, uh, uh, let us know what what how do you how do you see it, and also add add to that if you can. How how is Europe reacting to? Uh, to the story? Are they saying, well, this is the Trump we know, or uh, 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 how, how, is it, uh, how is it playing there? Well, this is the Trump Michael Wolf told us about in the very first months. Um, a Trump who's ignorant, who has ide fix that have been with him for 40 years, who is a nationalist, doesn't like foreigners, likes authoritarians. Um, I think what's interesting about the book, which I have not read, I've just read excerpts in the Wall Street Journal, I've read Susan's piece, I've read everybody's pieces, um, is, you, you know, John Bolton is a lawyer, and this is an indictment, right? It's really, really a book. It's, it's, it's really setting out what's wrong with this guy and why he should not be reelected. The problem is, and I, I think Peter is right, there's a lot of worry that Trump can easily paint Bolton not just as a warmonger and a crazy guy with a mustache, but part of the Washington elite that Trump still thinks he's running against, right? That, that Bolton represents all those old thinking, warmongering, let's get America involved in Iran, let's shoot him up, let's be irresponsible. Forgetting that, of course, Bolton was horrified by Trump's efforts on, on North Korea, for example. But Trump will caricaturize everything. Um, and it is true, the base will hold. The big question is the people in the middle, like the people who voted against the Republicans in, in the midterms, will they continue to vote against the Republicans for, frankly, a very fragile Joe Biden, who everybody thinks is probably a one-term president. 
So part of what Europe is worried about is even if Biden wins, I mean, has the United States become so partisan that the consistency of American policies now is destroyed and that any commitment America makes depends on who's in office and for how long, that you can count on a decision for two years or maybe four years, but after that, you don't know. Now that really does undermine a kind of basic understanding of the transatlantic relationship. And I think that's really part of the importance of the next five or six months. Bolton's part of it. I mean, some of the stuff is shocking. I mean, it is clear Trump has never understood NATO and hates it. It's clear he doesn't know that Britain has um, has nuclear weapons. <laughs> he thinks Finland is still part of Russia. This is an incredibly ignorant man, but he's ignorant to people like us. And as Peter says, there's a really open question about whether Americans care that much about that kind of thing, or think of him still as a breaker of idols. And, and, and that we'll have to see. Uh, Stephen, st staying, staying with you, because I think this last point on the transatlantic relationship uh, and, and Susan, you conclude your piece by saying if Trump gets reelected, NATO's in deep trouble uh, because of his visceral dislike for Europeans and, 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 and NATO as such. And we've seen part of this playing out just this week. Uh, Trump has announced uh, 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 troop cuts in Germany. We've had sanctions on the staff of the International Criminal Court. Uh, the U.S. has just broken off talks. On, uh, on, on taxation, on modernizing the taxation regime on digital, and, you ha and, and threatening, again, tariffs on, on, on European imports. Um, uh, it, it really looks like we're escalating uh, a, a very, you know, an already pretty bad situation uh, into uh, the possible breaking point. Is that, is that how Europe is looking at it as they, as they watch what's cr coming across the Atlantic? Um, it has been a very difficult, Week at the same time, you know, partly people think it's Richard Grinnell, who used to be the ambassador in Germany, who's now in Washington, pressing Trump's buttons on German troops, which has been a big, a big Grinnell issue for uh, quite a long time. Also, they've angered the, the Europeans by holding this little summit meeting that's coming up between Serbia and Kosovo under American auspices at the White House when it's been the European Union that has been trying to sort of mediate that, that deal. The ICC is one of John Bolton's great hatreds. He's always hated it. And the Americans have never signed up to it. But to actually sanction ICC judges and staff for even looking into the possibility of American war crimes in Afghanistan or Israeli war crimes. Um, again, I think with Trump, a lot of it's about the base. He can say, I'm pushing these international jurists who are, you know, fey people who aren't American patriots, I'm pushing them aside. I'm, you know, bringing troops back home, which I promised to do. Um, I'm pushing the Germans and everyone else to spend more on their own defense. Um, I'm fighting traditional thinking in Washington. I think, you know, if I were a Trump PR guy, that's how I would sell it. But in general, the Europeans are kind of keeping their head down um, and asking themselves, could he pull out of NATO all by himself? And I think the answer is no. There's like a one year waiting period and Congress could probably stop it and would probably not authorize the money to have it. But I remember actually, this is the last thing I'll say about this. About a year ago, I actually asked Nancy Pelosi, wouldn't it be a good idea to pass a law that made it necessary for a two thirds vote of the Senate to pull out of NATO since it took a two thirds vote of the Senate to go into NATO. And she left, so oh, that won't be necessary. Well, I begin to wonder now. Well, there is a, uh, there is a law that says that uh, uh, no money can be spent on pulling out from NATO. So there is a, at least a congressional uh, um, means to uh, delay, if not, if not stop it. Um, uh, nevertheless, the, the, the fact that we are uh, talking about these things is in and of itself pretty pretty uh, astonishing. Peter, uh, yes. you know, back to your old Han in Brussels, 
uh, and, and some of the, uh, the economic issues uh, that are there too, uh, we tend to focus a lot on the security side and uh, because of the melodrama and the importance of NATO and, and other issues, and, and some of us have personal uh, links to it. But on the economic side, it probably is actually deeper. Uh, and this this late spat over over taxation of uh, uh, of digital uh, technology and and the the reality that there's an impasse so let's not have negotiations and you can't do anything it's pretty remarkable it is pretty remarkable but but let's remember that this also predates the trump administration right this is something that the us and europe have been at odds at basically since this, since the uh, edward snowden revelations i mean the germans in particular were neuralgic about the fact that it appeared that the Americans were using their servers in the U.S. to spy on Germans, essentially. Um, and there's been a huge backlash against – sort of huge resurgence of anti-Americanism, I would argue, in Germany ever since then. And we've seen the EU push for – reassurances there's something that, that is called now it's called the the, the digital shield uh, that is it allows u.s law and european law to cover each other on data privacy but there's been a lot of push in germany in particular to go after american uh, tech companies to go after uh, u.s law because they do think that there is a laxity in the u.s over data privacy and that's allowed both intelligence and law enforcement agencies in the U.S. to spy on Germans. So I, I think there is a, an underlying distrust now that predates Trump um, that, that any new president is going to have to deal with. And it has been exacerbated clearly by the, by the, the brinkmanship of the Trump administration and, frankly, the, the lack of, of diploma, diplomatic you know, niceties that, that, that Trump has, has um, uh, brought to bear. But let, let's – trying to take a step back on this, I think both on security issues and on ec economic issues, there are far more fundamental underlying problems that even if Trump wasn't president uh, would be problematic right now. So, again, to shift quickly over to the security side – Yes, Trump has exacerbated this, but I think you know, I think you might have been there. I certainly was. You know, Robert Gates's last speech as Secretary of Defense was in Brussels, and his message was, "Europe, you have to start shouldering your part of the burden." This is something that presidents, frankly, for decades have been saying. Back to Reagan. So the fact that Trump has been pushing the Europeans to spend more on defense is not new, and frankly, it's an American interest if the non-British bits of NATO and the non-Canadian bits of NATO uh, in Europe start paying for their fair share. And I think the interesting dynamic to watch right now is both with Brexit and with sort of the, the with Trumpism and, and, and the equivocal position of the United States in NATO, whether this actually triggers something in Europe to finally get their act together. You know, there has been a push in France in particular to work with the Germans on something. It's been hindered by the fact the military itself, the French military likes to work with the Brits. Um, does this suddenly become a moment, we've heard Angela Merkel talk about it, we've heard uh, Emmanuel Macron talk about it, where Europe decides, okay, we have to be serious about this. We can no longer rely on the Americans and their British friends to protect us. We have to actually start spending more money on our, on our own defense. And I think it's a good outcome that may be triggered by a bad thing, but I think it is in American best interest if our European NATO allies start paying more for, for our, our collective defense. So again, trying to be the optimist here, um, I think there is potentially good things that come out of a very bad situation. Well, just, to, just on, on the optimism, remember there's this 2% pledge that by 2024, NATO countries should play, spend 2% of GDP on defense. And oh, behold, everyone is increasing that percentage because their economies are collapsing, not because we're spending more on, on defense, but that's a, even the Germans are, 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 are now paying more uh, than they had projected to be paying because of the uh, decline in their GDP. Uh, Susan, uh, 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 one has the impression uh, of of the internal debate uh, on NATO and issues like that, um, that the number of defenders of NATO within uh, within the White House is actually not as large as one would expect. Uh, that in fact the the, the Trump uh, argument is is gaining some uh, some measure, not complete, but some measure of support on Europe, on trade, on. Uh, uh, on NATO not doing enough and that maybe we really need to focus somewhere else. Is that a fair reading from uh, in the Bolton book or just as a fair reading in, 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 in your own reporting? You know, I think it's an, a good observation, Evo, and here's the reason why. I, you know, we talk a little bit, uh, you know, both Peter and Steve, I talk about sort of the, the politics of Trump foreign policy. Uh, 
the truth of the matter is nobody, no American voter gives a hoot about the ICC uh, or some of the other international treaties that John Bolton essentially came into the Trump administration to get rid of, right? He saw, uh, in a way, like Steve Bannon, the possibility to use Donald Trump, uh, a man without an agenda, largely, except for his own uh, uh, goals, uh, to use him to accomplish their pre-existing goals. Arguably, that's why you've seen the embrace by the evangelical community of Donald Trump, not because they think Donald Trump is uh, a saintly man who, who even shares their views, but because they saw the opportunity to achieve specific political ends. Uh, so, you know, that's one thing. Uh, you know, Donald Trump in a second term, as in a first term, would be surrounded by uh, cynical opportunists, uh, because those are the kind of people uh, whom he has attracted. Uh, it's hard to imagine any others. However, he increasingly is surrounded uh, less by even those opportunists than he is by people who have shown uh, that they meet the main criterion for the job, which is loyalty. And one takeaway for me as a longtime observer of Washington is the extent to which we have consistently overstated the role of ideology in forming uh, party positions on issues, including foreign policy issues. And uh, Republicans have shown a remarkable, remarkable willingness to jettison things that, you know, I certainly took to be foundational principles of their views about the United States and the world, whether it comes to free trade, uh, as what I thought was a bedrock principle of the Republican Party, uh, and opposition to tariffs, of course, would be uh, one of the, the founding tenets of, of any free trader's ideology out the window because Donald Trump said it was out the window. Number one, uh, Russia is another great example and support for NATO and European partnership as a cornerstone of how America interacted in the world. Uh, so I would say when you look at these internal debates that John Bolton describes, when you think about what would Trump foreign policy be in a second term, uh, it would be a mistake uh, to think that there is any sacred cow, ideologically speaking, for uh, the Republicans in a second Trump term or even for uh, those officials inside the administration. So I, that's my strong, strong takeaway, number one. Number two, however, the internal politics, Washington politics of these issues matter much more uh, to a certain extent than national uh, political debates over them. Uh, the truth of the matter is there has been a broad sentiment in American society across the political spectrum uh, that we saw in the Obama years as well as the Trump years to uh, focus on American renewal, to look inward, um, very disillusioned with uh, the Iraq and Afghanistan wars that again cuts across the American political spectrum. There are very different responses to it that we've seen from Barack Obama and Donald Trump, but the the overall macro political impulse uh, essentially is is one that I think has not not been diminished or not changed at all. Um, I think that that, uh, that that sentiment is certainly there. Uh, importantly, um, uh, Peter Susan mentioned that probably the most harrowing chapter. Uh, in the Bolton book is, is, uh, relates to Korea. And we've seen in the last week uh, some very serious escalation by the North, um, really cutting off any uh, diplomatic relations with the South, which was the, the, the beginning of the, the bromance that was allowed to, uh, uh, to uh, b become real in Singapore and beyond. Uh, where, where, uh, what, what's happening uh, in that relationship? How do we explain what uh, the North Koreans are trying to achieve? And where do you see this going? I mean, interestingly, I think the two things are very related, right? There is the, 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 the you know, the, the, the event that is leading us to talk about this is in Kaesong, there was a, a, a joint building where for cooperation um, between the South and the North and, and the North Koreans just blew it up. Um, a, you know, a, a fit of peace. So, <laughs> yes, actually blew it up, uh, literally with, with explosives. Um, and, you know, this is something we have come to expect, I guess, from, from, Kim, uh, from the Kim regime, because when he gets angry, he, he lashes out. But there are two things, two people this affects very, very uh, uh, importantly. First is, is the South Korean president. Uh, you know, President Moon came in to office in 2017 wanting to make a sharp break from President Park, his predecessor, who was a very much a hardliner on North Korea. President Moon was the first to reach out both to, to the Kim regime, but also to Donald Trump to say, guys, let's stop the belligerence, let's get together, let's have talks. And it was at President Kim's 
initiative that this first bromance started. Um, you know, what is clear from from the Bolton book is that Trump latched onto it mostly for the show. The, the show, and as Susan points out uh, in her column, there is issues that are frankly, have left most of Americans aghast or most American foreign policy people aghast in that he seems to not care about the fact that we have regular joint uh, tra training uh, uh, exercises with the South Korean uh, military uh, because we have a treaty obligation to protect South Korea. He seems to not want to do that, thinks it's too expensive. Um, I, I think the reaction, frankly, to, to, to the Bolton book has been pretty shocking as well, where he went on Twitter and says he basically agrees with Kim, Kim Jong-un's characterization of John Bolton. Um, well, why was he your national security advisor if you really believe the North Korean dictator over your own national security advisor. Um, so it puts two things at risk. One is President Moon himself. Uh, this is someone who basically has his entire legacy was based on his ability to rapprochement with the North, um, to bring Trump in, to sort of you know, settle relations and in some ways start moving towards a, a, a reunification. That is now uh, completely collapsed. And you have uh, Kim himself and his, his sister is becoming incredibly more uh, powerful within the regime, openly mocking President uh, Moon now. Uh, and so that is, that is on, 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 on the wreckage of, of, of history. And I guess the question becomes whether South Korea then flips back uh, to a much more belligerent stance with the North uh, and what that means for U.S. policy in the region. Because you know, again, famously, President Obama, when he did the handoff with, with, with Trump, said this is the place he saw the most likely hot conflict to occur. Um, Trump, Moon himself, I think, gets a lot of, should get a lot of credit for de-escalating that tension. But if we see a change in policy in, in the South and Trumpism uh, continuing, I think that the, pro the prospects of a re-escalation there uh, is really dangerous because you will see Kim begin to lash out because he's not getting what he wants. He's not getting attention. He's not getting a lifting of sanctions. Uh, and, and, and you know, there is economic pain in North Korea. And so I think we've gone for three years without the North being a real flashpoint. And I think uh, what this signals, the Kaesong uh, explosion, is that it's back on the table. We have to be really renewed uh, concern about uh, North Korea being a real flashpoint of, of international tension. And Susan, uh, in, in the meantime, I think the New York Times reported uh, that the estimate is that since Singapore, uh, North Korea has produced sufficient nuclear material for 20 more nuclear weapons. Uh, it hasn't tested a, a nuclear weapon since then, uh, and nor has it uh, launched any uh, long-range missiles. But that, one, remember, was uh, was the fire and fury uh, uh, comment that uh, that was not only the title of the Wolf book, but also the comment that the president made with regard to uh, North Korea that he was going to go after. Uh, him, uh, are, are, you know, this is a we, we know a president can change uh, a course, uh, and as he is not succeeding on the denuclearization through negotiations, are we going to see an escalation uh, back to the way we saw it in uh, in the summer of 2017? Well, it's a good question to ask, uh, Yvonne. I'm I'm actually struck by the fact that fewer people are asking it. It's a it's it's a reminder of Trump's great success in uh, distracting us from the distractions uh, over and over again. And, uh, you know, do you remember when Donald Trump wanted uh, and believed that he was entitled to the Nobel Peace Prize for the uh, brilliant denuclearization pact that he negotiated with Kim in Singapore? Uh, you know, we can chuckle about it now, but, uh, you know, he was serious in his delusion about that, at least. Uh, and in fact, there are credible reports that, uh, you know, they actually pressured the Japanese to nominate Donald Trump for a Nobel Peace Prize for his dealings with Kim Jong-un. So I say that because on some level, to our conversation about facts matter, you know, we, we forget and, and, and avert our eyes from certain of the facts of what happened over the last three years because they are so absurd and fantastical, uh, it's, it's actually hard to process them. So what does that tell us in a meaningful sense about North Korea policy? Uh, and I'm gonna put policy in quotes there, look, we are less than five months away from the US presidential election. Uh, if you look down the list of world leaders of who might want Donald Trump to remain in power for another four years, uh, Kim Jong-un has gotta be basically number one on that list, it seems to me, because uh, you know he's never gonna have another American president who says he has a love affair with him. He's never gonna have another American president who takes the boilerplate uh, you know, garbage that's sent in pro forma communications and describes them as beautiful love letters. 
uh, and is so willing to give away almost anything in negotiations in exchange for a photo op uh, that uh, masquerades as diplomacy. So I think that uh, this was clearly a message to Donald Trump to blow up the building. Uh, and it was, a you know, as you put it, I think correctly, it's like a, a toddler's cry, you know, for attention, essentially. And uh, what's been interesting is that Trump so far, perhaps because America appears to be imploding and melting down uh, with interlocking uh, crises of actual serious gravity, Trump has so far not taken the bait. You haven't basically heard anything from the administration. Uh, so uh, I don't think uh, either the prospect of uh, raising attention to his failed nuclear diplomacy is in Trump's interest right now. And I also don't think uh, that uh, scaring people about the idea of himself with his hand on the nuclear trigger in a confrontation with North Korea is something that Trump or his campaign wants right now. So I don't think they're gonna talk about it. Steve, uh, I don't know if you uh, wanna add anything to this and it, uh, the, the uh, European perspective as well. I, I do wanna get, uh, we, we have got four minutes left. I wanna get to Russia for before we end uh, today, but, but please. Sure. I mean, let, let, let me just say two sentences which people speculate about here, um, which is the North Korea regime is in a lot of difficulty. We don't know the extent of the virus. We know they're having food problems. Um, some people wonder whether Kim is ill, whether this is his sister creating uh, a kind of credibility with the army and the people. I mean, there's a lot we don't know about this place, but it feels like something's changing there. And I think that's part of what interests quite a lot of people. Anyway, yep. that's the end of what I would say about that. That's, a, that's an important, I think an important uh, addition. Uh, Susan, uh, Russia, we're, we're, we're about to have a, a parade. Uh, we're about to have a referendum that will ensure that Vladimir Putin can be main president for, to what, 2036? Um, in a country that is now number two when it comes to coronavirus uh, uh, infections, uh, and presumably the death rate is far higher than it is publicly being admitted, uh, and opening up as if the whole thing has uh, been opened, uh, it, it, it is over. Uh, how's this going to end up? You know, Evo, just briefly, strongman politics have not proven to be a very good match with a virus that doesn't care about your Twitter feed and doesn't care uh, you know, if your people perceive you to have a lot of authority or not. And Russia, I think, is gonna be studied as one example of that. Of course, Donald Trump is gonna be studied as another example of that. Donald Trump says, don't wear masks, even though his government says wear masks, and wants to reopen the country and have a rally this weekend in Oklahoma. Vladimir Putin's version of that is ordering cities around Russia to hold delayed versions of their uh, World War II victory parades from uh, May. They've been postponed to this week, presumably to give people a patriotic buzz of good feeling before they then go and vote on July 1st on the referendum that would essentially uh, extend Putin into almost life tenure in uh, the job of leading the Kremlin. So. His approval ratings have really never been lower. Uh, you know, the story there is a decline that began before coronavirus, I should say, but uh, has continued. And this is even according to the state-run pollsters. You've seen an erosion of Putin's authority. And I think the pandemic in part has accelerated that because it shows uh, that strongman rule uh, is ineffective against a public health crisis. It shows that Russia failed to invest uh, its oil money when there was uh, oil riches. Now, of course, uh, the price of uh, natural resources has plummeted, but it shows that Russia failed to invest under Putin in its own people. And now you have this very interesting situation where Putin is at odds with uh, the regional governors who he himself and his own uh, government put into power. Uh, because they're trying to impose public health measures that he doesn't want. And you've had many cities around Russia actually canceling uh, the parades that Putin ordered or suggesting to people, as Moscow mayors did on state TV this week, that maybe they'd be better off staying home to the parade that they are throwing. So again, let's watch this one as an interesting case study of uh, the politics of the pandemic.
Can I throw one in there, Evo, before we, we go jump? The other person I think we really need to watch is Brazil, uh, Joe Bolsonaro. Uh, you know, he is basically facing a potentially a revolt with his own government. The courts are revolting against him for the same reason as Susan says about Putin. He has decided that, that hydrochloxy, uh, chloroquine is the solution and everyone is beginning to die in Brazil as a result. And I think it's another authoritarian we need to watch because I think you could see probably him as well. Stephen, last word, uh, is the, ro- the, 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 the budding romance with Russia that was emerging before the coronavirus in Paris and other places, is that now gone or uh, uh, the debate will continue? Trump still wants him in the G8. Trump wants him to come to Washington. I mean, the whole American government resists. But again, this is one more example where, where Trump's the president, he admires Putin, and um, Certainly, if he's reelected, I am very curious to see what our Russia policy, policy in quotes, is going to be. Um, and I'll leave it there, Evo. Thank you. Well, thank you all uh, a lot. We could still have uh, delved into annexation of the West Bank and Israel, uh, many other issues. And we will be back uh, next week uh, for World Review. Uh, Susan, Stephen, Uh, Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great weekend. And thank you all for watching. Uh, Join in uh, us next week for another World Review. Bye-bye.